Great, so let's take a look at Apache Hive in a couple of contexts. Right now, I have a Linux-based virtual machine running right here, and it's got the full Cloudera distribution with Apache Hadoop CDH version 4 installed. Uh, I have this virtual machine on the network, so it has an IP address, which on my local network is 192.168.1.188. And because of that, I can actually talk to it from my regular web browser from, from my Windows PC. And the Cloudera distribution of Hadoop has a whole browser-based user interface uh, for many of the Hadoop components, including Hive. In fact, the Hive user interface in Cloudera is called Beeswax. And that's exactly what we're running here. This is the Beeswax UI for Hive. And what I'm going to do is just run a couple of simple queries. I've actually saved a couple of these queries, so you don't have to watch me type them. We're going to start with a simple query against a table called sample underscore zero seven. And all we're going to do is a straight select star, meaning bring back all the rows from the table. Now, if I go ahead and hit execute, you'll see that data actually comes back very quickly. Part of the reason it comes back quickly is because I've run it already. So things are somewhat cached. But the more important factor is by doing a select star, we are telling Hive it can simply bring back the contents of the entire file. It doesn't really have to do any work, it just has to dump the file. So if we go back to save queries and pick another version of that same query, but in this case we have a where condition, we only want to see data where the salary field is greater than $50,000. If I click Execute this time, what's going to happen is a whole Hadoop MapReduce job is going to kick off. We're going to see all kinds of uh, slightly obscure output. And after a short amount of time, if I can scroll down quickly enough before the refresh happens, you'll see a message at the bottom that the MapReduce job has kicked off. You'll see a message that says map equals 0% and Hadoop equals 0%. And eventually we'll get the data back. Now, rather than making you watch this, what I'm going to do is move over to Excel and we're going to connect to another instance of Hive, this time in Microsoft's cloud-based version of Hadoop called HD Insight. Microsoft also supplies an Excel add-in for Hive, and if I click on the Data tab of the ribbon, and then the Hive pane button in that ribbon, which appears once the add-in is installed, I'll get a special task pane here. If I pick this data source that I had already set up, and I log in with my password, eventually what will happen is will pre-populate with the, the single sample table that is in that instance of Hive. It's called Hive Sample Table. And we'll get a default uh, little query here. Select star from Hive Sample Table. And in this case, we're going to limit it to 200 rows. There are about 60,000 rows in that table total. I'm going to go ahead and click Execute Query. And you'll see that the data is going to come back inside of our spreadsheet. I can go ahead and, and close the Hive Query pane. Now what's neat about this, we're in version 2013 of Excel, which has a built-in data visualization product called PowerView. And PowerView previously was only built into SharePoint, number one, and number two could really only work against data that was uh, added to a power pivot model or an analysis services model. In effect, by bringing this data into the spreadsheet, we've implicitly created a power pivot model in the background, which means that if I go into the insert tab and then click the power view button, I'm going to see a data model already produced with a single table in it that mirrors the data in the table we just pulled into sheet one. And that's this table right here. Now it pre-selects a bunch of fields for me, which is considerate of it, but it's not really what I'm interested in. I just want to pick two fields, the device platform and the query dwell time. 
I want to resize this a bit, say like that. And let's move this from being a, a grid with text-based data to being a column chart. That'll update itself in a moment. Then I'll click down below it and we'll do another visualization. This time we'll do device make and query dwell time. We're going to move this down here. We'll resize it. We'll set it up to be a line chart. So what I'll do now is bring in state as a filter. I'll just go ahead, click state, resize this a little bit and change it to a slicer that turns it into a filter. And now what we can do is click on a given state and see the breakdown of smartphone data in that state. Of course, this is only for the first 200 rows, so the data is a little bit skewed. But notice if we click on New York, there's a lot of Android and only a little iOS. If we go to California, I'm willing to bet it's going to be pretty much the reverse, and it is. If we click on iPhone OS up here, we see Apple is the only manufacturer. Let's make things a little bit bigger. And if we click on Android, we'll see LG and Samsung. And if we clear the filter, then we'll see the whole range of Android manufacturers, HTC, LG, Motorola, uh, and Samsung. So that is a great demo of why Hive can be useful. It lets us take business intelligence and data visualization tools that we might be familiar with against more conventional databases, and it makes them usable against Hadoop. By the way, if we flip back over to the browser, you'll see that the data did come in from our SQL query. But what you'll also see is that a relatively simple query like that has some lag time, has some overhead. And so doing a number of those queries consecutively and iteratively can involve some inconvenience.